Vincent Pastore says something very interesting in this docuseries. He says, murder is murder, whether you're doing it as a mobster on the street or you're doing it as a soldier defending your country, you're still committing murder. Interesting concept. What do you think about that? Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. It is Mob Movie Monday. Hope you all had a great weekend. I did. It was kind of relaxing, but uh, we look forward to that, right? And uh, today, Mob Movie Monday, we're going to do something a little bit different. It's not really a movie. It's a docu-series, but I think an excellent one. It was put out by AMC Studios, the TV network. I love them, by the way. They do some good stuff. Walking Dead. I don't know if you watched that, but I was engrossed in that show. Watched all 10 seasons, whatever it might have been. But they did a good one here. It was called Making of the Mob. It was a limited series, a docu-series, meaning that there are actors and so on and so forth. There's also people giving commentary, like Selwyn Robb, who wrote the book, uh, The Five Families, a guy that I know pretty well, wrote an excellent book, by the way, did a tremendous amount of research. He's kind of like a mob expert. Vincent Pastore, we all know who he is. He's played in so many mob shows and movies. I loved him in the original Gotti movie on HBO. And of course, he did The Sopranos, a whole bunch of stuff. He's terrific. And uh, a few other people. I'm going to review this. I'm going to do one episode at a time. May not do every single episode. I'm going to do the ones that stand out in my head, but I think you're going to enjoy Enjoy it. AMC Studios, if you haven't seen it, watch the whole two seasons. First one is all about, you know, the rise of the mob in New York. And season two is about the rise of the mob in Chicago. So really well done. Before we get to that, let me say this. You know, we, you know we hit 500,000 subscribers. We did it in less than 10 months, nine months to be exact. I'm proud of that. I'm grateful to that. I'm humbled by that because, like I said, you have a lot of content you can tune in. The fact that you tune into mine, I appreciate it very much. Big giveaway. We're announcing the winners shortly. And you're going to love it. Whoever gets the first prize is going to love it, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, we got a lot of other prizes that we're doing. And we'll continue these giveaways in our appreciation to show our appreciation for those of you that tune in. So subscribe. Get on and subscribe. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up, a lot of interviews that we've been doing. You'll see them. And, uh, you know, we're just enjoying it. So come on for the ride. Going to give you a little bit of a hint. A little bit of a hint. Sammy Gravano. Some of you have said, you know, Michael, what's happening with this? I think it's becoming closer to a reality. And that's all I can tell you. And let me tell you something. It's going to be a no-holds-barred interview. It's not an interview. It's a sit-down. It's going to be no-holds-barred. We're, we're, we're going to speak our peace to one another. And uh, neither one of us is shy. Let's put it that way. But we'll see what happens. Not 100% yet, but I think it's getting closer to reality. So we'll take it from there. What else? MichaelFrancis.com. We got over 14,000 people now that are in our network, in my crew. And people are just enjoying it. They're loving the Zoom calls and everything else that we do, the content that we're putting in, the encouragement you're giving one another. We love it. Keep it up. It's growing. It's great. And uh, again, thank all of you for participating and coming aboard. So let's get into it now. The making of the mob. I really liked episode one. Let me go back a little bit. Now, I got to tell you this. I'm not a mob historian. I know Sammy sometimes says he's really into, you know, the formation of the mafia in Italy and all of that. And I'm sure that he is. And he talks about it. And that's great. I don't consider myself a mob historian. Most of my history comes from a historical figure in that life, and that's my father. My father, you know, passed away at 103. He was born in 1917. He roamed the streets of New York, you know, from the time he was a child in Brooklyn, and he met up with a lot of people. My grandfather, Carmine Francis, Tootie the Lion, they called him. He wasn't a made guy, but he, he was around a lot of guys. My, my grandfather had a bar and a bakery. A lot of the guys would come in. My grandfather would sit with them. My father met them when he was a kid. I'm talking about, you know, big names in that life. And I got a lot of history from my dad. That's where my history lesson comes from. Of course, uh, you know, aside from my own participation in that life. So, but I think this series was done really well. In episode one, it tells us how, you know, Cosa Nostra in this country was really formed. Now, remember this. Lucky Luciano, 
who is credited with forming the commission. He came to the United States as an immigrant with his family in, I believe, 1906, and that's what's shown in this docuseries. Like many other guys at that time, Italians that came over, you had a choice. You either went the legitimate way, you, you know, you got a job, you were a hardworking family, or some of them obviously went to the street. And what they did at that time, and this was brought out in Godfather 2 with a guy by the name of Fenucci, I believe his name was, a lot of the guys, you know, street guys, started preying on their own people, shop owners, extorting them for money, you know, robbing people. That's how the mob was, the mob, I won't call it Cosa Nostra yet, that's how the mob was back in the early days uh, when they immigrated from Italy. It wasn't a, a thing to be proud of in any way, shape, or form. When you're feeding off your own people, not a good thing. But they had that instinct, they had that inclination, they were street guys, and this is how they wanted to make their money. So, Lucky Luciano, you know, he grows up on the street, he meets up with a couple of Jewish guys, Maya Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, they became very, very tight friends. So, you know, the origin of Cosa Nostra in this country was really formed uh, in, in many ways by the Jews and the Italians. Luciano played a big role. So did Maya Lansky. So did Bugsy Siegel. And another guy that we're going to get to uh, had a, a lot to do with the formation of Cosa Nostra here in this country. So basically, as the show goes on, uh, you know, Luciano starts to show himself to be a capable street guy. He hooks up with uh, Costello at one point in time. He actually does some work for Frank Costello, who was uh, a guy that was uh, already a little bit older than uh, Luciano. And he already has kind of made his name on the streets. And uh, there's a couple of interesting things, you know, as we go along that I want to point out. Out. One of the uh, commentators, a guy by the name of Michael Green, he makes a statement that there's kind of separation in the mob guys. And the reason he talks about this is because Lucky Luciano hadn't killed anybody or murdered anybody, according to this uh, documentary, until he was 25 years old. So he was roaming the streets, and unlike other guys that, you know, were killed in an earlier age, he hadn't committed his first murder until he was 25 years old. And Michael Green kind of makes this distinction. He says, you know, there were guys that, you know, just liked to kill, and guys that did it because they had to kill. And I can tell you from my own personal experience in that life that that's the truth. There were guys there that that was their forte. You know, give me a job, give me some work, I'm going to do it, not going to bother me. As soon as I finish, I'll go and have some dinner. No big deal whatsoever. And they were those kind of street guys. It didn't seem to bother them. You know, this is how they were. And there were other guys that, like Lucky, and it seemed to be that he was one of those guys, he did it when he had to do it. Enjoy it. You know, Roy DeMeo comes to mind right away. Kuklinski, who wasn't really involved with the mob, I'll tell you that right now, he's a guy that comes that way. I heard Sammy Gravano once say, you know, the first time he killed somebody, he said it publicly, he was 17 years old, and it didn't even bother him, you know, in a way. You know, Sammy described it that way. So there's guys that can do that and just go about their business afterwards. And then there's guys that, hey, they got to kill because that's what they're assigned to do. That's their assignment. That's part of the life. And sometimes that's the business of the life. Lucky Luciano presented himself as that type of guy. So he starts to rise in the ranks. And he and Maya Lansky and Bugsy Siegel, they're under control of a guy by the name of Mazzaria, who was the guy at that time. And uh, he was kind of the made guy, the, the big shot mob guy at that time. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're working under him and they're kind of proving themselves. And Mazaria, you know, according to everything I heard, my dad talked to me about him, wasn't a nice guy. He was pretty brutal type of guy, very, very greedy, didn't treat his underlings that well. All he cared about was money and power, and that was it. And unfortunately, there are guys like that in my life. So anyway, as this goes along, we see that, you know, Lucky and Meyer, these are not, you know, these are not wimpy guys. These are street guys. They're tough guys in their own way. They're not really happy being under Mazaria's control, but they understand, you know, he was a guy and they got to do what they got to do. Then something happens, you know, they're kind of, you know, into a little bit gambling, trying to make some money here and there. And then something happens that I've said this before in other videos uh, that changed the, the whole structure, the whole concept of the mob here in America, and that was Prohibition. When Prohibition came in, the guys on the street, guys like Mazaria, Luciano, Maya Lansky, they knew how to take advantage of it. And the government, I'll say this over and over again, it was the government that gave the power to the mob in America by Prohibition. 
the 10, 12, 13 years, whatever it was that prohibition was in effect, the mob capitalized on it in a big way. They became somewhat of an organization because they now had the money, the power, and they were giving the public what they wanted that they couldn't get legally. And that was it. You know, some things you just can't litigate. You know, people want to have alcohol. Not everybody gets drunk with alcohol. Back then, they thought it was a moral thing that they were doing by stopping the sale of alcohol. It was a, a moral issue as well as a legal issue. Well, that experiment had failed, obviously, but the mob took advantage of it, made a tremendous amount of money. You know the story of Al Capone. We'll get to that. That's season two. But the mob in New York made a tremendous amount of money, and that's what gave them the power and the juice and the money, you know, to succeed as an organization. So, a couple of things along the way that I thought was really interesting, too. Vincent Pastore, who I love, by the way, as an actor, he's terrific. He appears and he gives his, uh, you know, opinion on certain things. And he says something. He said, you know, in the mob life, there's some guys that like to murder again, and some guys that, you know, they just did it because they had to do it. But you know what he said? He said, you know, murder is murder. Whether you're committing it as a mobster or you're committing it as a soldier, you know, defending your country, you're still committing murder. Now, I'm not advocating that, but I understand what he's saying. You know, I'm not in any way putting down our, our military because our military is fighting, you know, to uh, defend our nation. It's an honorable thing when they go to war, but they're still committing murder, you know, <laughs> no matter which way you look at it. And guys in the mob think that, well, you know, I took an oath, it's omerita. If I'm told to do something, if I give an order, if a guy steps out of line and he violates, you know, the, the oath, and I have to, uh, you know, commit a murder as a result, I'm doing my job. So it was very interesting the way Vincent said that. And I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm not going to speak for myself at the moment, but, you know, if mob guys just say, hey, you know what, I'm doing my job. This is the way it is. And, uh, you know, they proceed in that regard. But it was, it was interesting to me the way uh, Vincent Pastore framed that. And obviously it's something that I thought about in my own head, you know, uh, many, many times during my time in that life. So we see the guys, uh, they kind of progress in that life. We see that, you know, prohibition gives them a lot more power. They're still under the control of Maseria. They don't like it. And then something really happens. Heroin, I don't know if you know this, heroin at one time was legal. It was in certain things like aspirin, and it was in, I think, cough syrup. It was kind of something that calmed you down. Small doses, obviously. And at one point in time, they made heroin illegal. Well, when that happened, again, guys on the street knew that there would be a thirst, a hunger for heroin, and guys like Mazzaria went into the drug business. I believe Luciano also went into the drug business at that time. He denies it, okay, but let's go according to what the documentary shows. He went into the drug business. He gets busted. Heroin is a big thing now. They start making a lot of money with it on the street. Tara Horrible. They say Luciano was giving it to a lot of the prostitutes that he was involved with at the time. Anyway, he gets busted, goes to jail for six months. Could you imagine that? Six months for heroin. Today you go for 60 years, you know, for drugs. But anyway, six months for heroin. He gets out and uh, Masseria doesn't, you know, take care of him. And let me tell you another thing. There's a big fallacy, a big myth on the street that when you get in trouble and you go to jail that the family, you know, your cousin Oster family takes care of you. Uh, I haven't seen that. You know, when my dad first went away, yeah, he was getting money every month, but the money he got every month was money that was his. He had it out on the street, he had certain things that he had, you know, and they took care of that for him, but it was his money. They were collecting it for him. And that didn't last that long, believe me. A couple of years and that was over. My dad, don't forget, got a 50-year sentence. So another reason why I took to the street, because our family needed money. That was it, you know, for lawyers to, and just to live. My mom, my, my, my brothers and sisters, they needed money. And I felt an obligation as, as the older one to go and do it. But anyway, he comes out. And when he comes out, Maya Lansky uh, had met somebody in New York that kind of changed Luciano's outlook on the street and that was Arnold Rothstein. Now I spoke about him once before. Arnold Rothstein, they called him the brain. He was a brilliant guy. He was big into gambling. He was the guy that allegedly fixed the Black Sox game in 1919, the World Series game. Allegedly he made four million dollars on it. Tremendous money back in 1919 and uh, he was a brilliant guy. But he was a business type of guy. He was the polar opposite of Masseria 
who Luciano had been under and Lansky and Siegel all that time. So what happens is Arnold Rothstein is introduced to Luciano by Meyer Lansky and he kind of takes him under his wing, under his tutelage. And Arnold Rothstein taught Luciano how to be a business guy. He said, look, this is a business and you got to treat it like a business. And you know, I have said this many times, I wrote it in my book, business is business. Whether you're doing illegal business on the street or you're doing legal business, you still got to operate it as a business. When I was in the gasoline business, we operated it like a business. Yes, we were defrauding the government out of taxes, but we had a business plan as to how to do that, and we followed the plan. We had accountants on the payroll. We had to make certain purchases. We had to do certain things. We had to run it like a business, even though it was illegal. And that's what Rothstein taught Luciano. I don't care what you're doing. He said, you got to do it like a business. And he kind of changed Luciano's way of thinking, because Luciano, in a way, was kind of sophisticated. Maya Lansky obviously was, another brilliant guy. Siegel was a little bit of a head case, you know, they called him Bugsy. But Luciano, again, now starts to think a little bit differently. A guy by the name of Rich Cohen, who was somewhat of a mob historian, makes a statement that it's a myth that the mob never got involved in drugs, and that was because of Godfather One when uh, Don Corleone, he didn't want to be involved in drugs in any way. And he says that's absolutely not true. And look, I got to say this. Obviously, guys were, Vito Genovese was involved in drugs. Mazzaria was involved in drugs. Luciano got pinched, got indicted for drugs, went to prison for that also. And yes, at that time, they were doing drugs. But later on, I will say this, and I said it a thousand times, and I'll say it again. In my lifetime, when I took the oath, I was told straight out, if I got involved with drugs, I'd die. And so we weren't involved, we weren't big drug dealers at that time. Tony de you remember him, soldier in my family, blew his brains out because he was doing a little drug deal, he got caught with the boss's son, and he was afraid that he was gonna get killed over it because we weren't supposed to do it. So he killed himself rather than walk in the room and not walk out again. We were not allowed to get involved in drugs. Guys were doing it sneaky on the side. They say Gotti's crew was involved in it. I don't know, he was, he was. But um, back then, yes, they were involved in drugs to a degree. So Luciano, Lansky, they've had enough of Mazzaria. This guy, you know, he doesn't want to share. He's asking for more money. They had enough of him, and they planned to kill him. I said, look, in that life, people, I got to tell you, in that life, uh, if you can't negotiate with a boss, if your guy is just greedy and he's power hungry and uh, you want to get away from that, you know, a lot of times there's only one way to do it, and they take him out, and that was it. So they planned to take him out, and this was such a serious thing. You know, Luciano and Lansky realized that because Mazzaria was a guy, he had a lot of strength, a lot of power, a lot of guys under him, that there was only one person they can talk to, and that would be Arnold Rothstein. So they have a, a meeting, a sit down with Arnold Rothstein, and they tell him what they want to do. And Rothstein initially says, you guys are crazy. You know what this means? You know what this is going to do for you? And he says, you know, there's safety in being a nobody and being unknown. He says, once this happens, you're going to be known. And truer statement was never made, I got to tell you. Joe Colombo, John Gotti, Paulie Castellano, all of these guys that were high profile guys. Michael Francis, I mean, I had a very high profile at that time. Sonny Francis, all the guys that were known, that had a high profile, you're going down. You're going down. One of the reasons so many guys were upset with Joe Colombo when he had that Italian-American Civil Rights League because he put everybody on blast. He put the whole mafia, the whole Cosa Nostra in this country, the whole family on blast. The FBI now, they started to know guys that they never knew before, guys that were picketing, guys that were at the Park Sheridan Hotel that they never knew were even associated or even belonged to the mob. Now they identified them. There's a danger in being known not only you know, by the feds, but on the street also. So Rothstein cautions him. He says, you know, you, know, you gotta take risks in life, but they gotta be calculated risks. He said, this could be something crazy. Um, but Luciano says, this is what we gotta do. We've made up our mind. We gotta get out from under this guy. And, and so they start to plan it. Um, the opposite of that, Chin Giganti, his theory was, I wanna be, not only do I wanna be unknown, I want people to think that I'm crazy. And this way they leave me alone. I mean, he went to the extreme, but it worked for him for, what, 25 years. You know, he used to roam the streets, Houston Street, you know, in a bathrobe with a beard and his hair ruffled up and people thought he was crazy. 
crazy like a fox. But he went the opposite way. He didn't want to be known. You know, Chin, he didn't care who you are, made guy or not. If he didn't want to meet you, he wasn't going to meet you. You know, he was he was smart in that regard. Eventually it blew up because, you know, there was guys on the street that named him and talked about him and surveillance tapes and wiretaps. And, you know, he became known that way, but not by his own accord. He wanted to remain unknown. The guys that last in that life are the guys that really nobody knows about. And if you can do it quietly, that's the way to do it. Another very interesting thing for me, Chaz Palminteri comes on in the end. He says something, he says, the guys that succeed in that life are guys that have intelligence and big balls. He says, it's a rare combination because so many guys have intelligence, but they don't have balls. And other guys have balls and they don't have intelligence. And when you got both, that's when you can succeed in that life. And I believe that to a degree. Now, having big balls doesn't mean that you're going around killing everybody, shooting everybody. It means that you got to take calculated risks sometimes. You got to do that. And you got to do it intelligently. You know, my dad always said that to me. You know, he said, Mike, you got to take risks in life, but they got to be calculated risks. You can't, you just fly off the handle and, and without thinking and just take a risk. You got to think of the situation. Sometimes it's good to take a risk, but they got to be calculated, meaning that you got to know if you do take this risk and you do win, how beneficial is it going to be to you? And on the other hand, if you take the risk and you lose, how much is it going to hurt? And I think Chaz Palminteri is right. As I think back, the guys that did make it in that life, you know, had intelligence and had balls. They knew what they had to do and they did it. Eventually, again, in that life, you're always going to get caught up because that's just the way it is now on the street. Can't trust everybody. The police have too many weapons. Law enforcement has too many weapons. So eventually, I tell people this all the time, you're going to go down anyway. But if you're going to succeed to a certain level, you got to take risks. I took a lot of risks in my life, a lot of calculated risks. And most of the time they paid off. I'm going to be honest with you. So that's it. So this first episode leaves off with Lansky, Luciano planning to take down Kill Mazaria. And then we're going to get into episode two. But I want you to watch it. It's a great series. You're going to enjoy it the entire way through. You'll enjoy the commentary because they say little things, you know, at least in this first episode that really made sense to me. Selwyn Robb, you know, he's a mob expert. If you never read the book Five Families, read it. It's this thick. I think they mentioned me and my dad when we're in it. Everybody's in it, you know, not only us. But uh, read it. It's a, it's a good commentary on the life. Vincent Pastore, he's played enough mob guys to know what the mob is about. He's great. But I do know one other guy I didn't mention, and that's Maya Lansky Jr. He was the grandson of Maya Lansky, and uh, I met him in Vegas. He attended my show when I had a mob story show down there. Really nice guy, and he talks about his grandfather a little bit, and I think you'll enjoy it. Ray Liotta, he narrates it. So, really good series. That was episode one. We'll get to episode two. We're going to go all the way through this. May not do it in order. May not be every Monday, but we're going to get through it. So, watch it and remember it, and we'll get to the next episode. So, that's it for today. Remember, we're thankful, 500,000 subscribers, really appreciate it. Big prize going to be announced very, very soon. And uh, I know you're going to love it. And uh, the other prizes too. MichaelFrancis.com, jump aboard. 14,000 in it now. Mafia Democracy coming soon, definitely over the summer. You're going to love that book. I guarantee it's going to be eye-opening. And the television series, based upon my life, we got the pilot. I love the script. It's getting into the next stage, so it's starting to heat up. I hope I can make announcements pretty soon soon. They'll be starting to cast it, I think, in the next month or so. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Be safe, be healthy. God bless you. And I do mean that. And I definitely will see you next time. Take care.